Good morning to you all, brothers and sisters. We want to thank God that he has given us the opportunity to worship him even in these difficult times where we have COVID-19 restrictions. But we want to thank God that we are still able to worship him even on uh, online services. Let us pray. Lord our God, we gather as those who know our need of your strength, as those who know our need of your mercy, as those who know our need for your love. We gather as those who long to know your presence deep within us, who long to follow your call with all our heart. We gather as your people and pray for your blessings. As Christians living in a broken world, we are aware of the need for healing in our lives, in the lives of others and in our world. Christ offers us that healing, wholeness and transformation. Father, we pray that you bring healing to our lives, bring change to our community. Thank you, Father. In your name I pray. Amen. I would ask Brother Ben to come and do the reading of the Word of God uh, from the book of Mark chapter 1, uh, verses 21 to 28. Morning, everyone. I hope your week's been fantastic. I've been very blessed this week. Um, as Johnson mentioned, I'll be reading from Mark 1, 21 to 28. And it's about Jesus teaches with authority. They went to Capernaum, where, uh, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teach, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, "What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth?" Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching? And with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. And that's this, uh, the scripture for this week. And can't wait to hear what Johnson's got to share with us and uh, what we've got to learn from him. This is the word of the Lord. Have a good week. Thank you so much, Brother Ben, for the reading of the word of God. Uh, <clears throat> this morning I've decided to share with you on the theme, Are You Troubled by Demons? Are you troubled by demons? <clears throat> For centuries, people believed that Aristotle was right when he said that the heavier an object, the faster it would fall to earth. Aristotle was regarded as the greatest thinker of all the time, and surely he would not be wrong. Anyone, of course, could have, have taken two objects, one heavier and one light, and dropped them from a great height to see whether or not the heavier object landed first. But no one did until nearly 2,000 years after Aristotle's death. Legend has said that in 1589, Galileo Samond lent professors to the base of the learning Tower of Pisa. Then he went to the top and pushed off a 10 pound and 1 pound weight. Both landed at the same instant. The power of belief was so strong. However, that the professors denied their eyesight. They continued to say Aristotle was right. So I believe that this illustrates perfectly what is going on in the world today. You could show the terrible ravaging effects of AIDS and people will have promiscuous sex anyway. You can show someone a diseased liver and cancerous lungs and people are going to abuse 
alcohol and smoke regardless of the sex. You know what I wish? I wish someone would just climb to the top of the tower and push off a 10 pound argument and one pound argument and let's just see if they reach the ground first. That would finally prove who is right and who is wrong. But then I am reminded that when Galileo did that, no one believed him. Even with the authority of obvious visible proof, the two ways reach the ground at the same time. The professors did not believe. The problem here is obvious. Most people are going to believe what they have always believed regardless of the facts. What they used to believe. But something different occurred in the life of Jesus. Something persuasive. Mark records that when Jesus came to Capernaum on the Sabbath day and entered the synagogue and told the crowds were astonished. Why? One word, authority. He taught not as the scribes taught, but as one having authority. So what is it that convinced them? What did they hear and see in the life of Christ that made him stand above all other teachers? Why were they so drawn to him? First, his teaching was new. It was new because Jesus moved from past tense to present tense. I will tell you what I mean in a moment, but let me try and set the stage first. If you ever take a tour of the Holy Land and one of the places you will visit is the ancient ruins of the city of Capernaum. It is a fishing town that Jesus made his headquarters while he was in Galilee. Why did he make his hometown? For one reason, good reason, it was Peter's hometown. What is remarkable is that you can go there today and see the erect walls of a small first century home. So the home has been identified since the time of Constantine as Peter's house. 100 feet from the front door of Peter's home are the remains of the synagogue of Jesus. So standing there with the winds of the Sea of Galilee blowing through the ruins, you can picture Jesus and Peter walking up in the Sabbath, walking across the street with the rest of their disciples and attending services. This being Peter's home synagogue, he probably had something to do with Jesus being asked to teach. It is a place where Jesus taught regularly. For a period of time, he was here there every week in the synagogue, teaching as a visiting rabbi. And as he began to teach, Mark tells us, the people were amazed. They were real amazed at what he was teaching. What amazed them is that when Jesus stood up to teach, he didn't say, Moses has taught us, or the Exodus teaches us, or the prophet Isaiah reminds us, or the rabbi so and so has said so. No. When he stood up in the synagogue, there in Peter's hometown, he said, I say to you, with authority, all the other rabbis told the people to offer a sacrifice in the temple for the remission of sins. But Jesus said to people directly, your sins are forgiven. So the rabbis all encouraged the people to believe in God. All along comes Jesus and he tells them, believe in God and believe also in me. He's not pointing to other things. He said, believe in God and believe also in me. So the difference was astonishing. All the other rabbis got their authority from quoting the scriptures and talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They referenced the rabbis before them to support their positions. But Jesus, he was something new. He was the authority. He didn't need to offer any reference, but he was the authority. He said, I am the door. I am the way, I am the gate, I am the good shepherd, I am the light of the world. So his teaching echoed with something new, something astonishing. God was no longer in the past. God was in the present, in the life of Jesus of Nazareth. So, and that brings us up the second reason why people were so drawn to him. He taught with authority. It was obvious in the synagogue that day that Jesus was a teacher of a different order because he didn't quote the authorities of the past. He was the authority himself. That was their first clue that something new was happening. But then something happened right in their midst that stunned them, made them sit up and take notice. He backed up what he taught with action. It may have been on Jesus' very first visit to the synagogue. In the middle of his sermon, that a man with an evil spirit interrupted him. Jesus then demonstrated the authority of his teaching with his power over the spirits. 
Let's take a look and what, see what happened. The first thing to notice is that the men did not burst into the synagogue disrupting the service. No. Mark tells us that this was a man within their synagogue. Probably a respected lay person, a productive member of the society. The synagogue leaders would not permit any other kind. So a second thing to notice is that this man's affliction is only identified as an evil spirit. So the demon is not tied to any sickness. What then was this demon doing to this man? We cannot say for sure, but I would suggest that the demon influence in this case was of a moral nature. Now, I don't know what moral issue this man had, but it was cheering him up. What do you think it was? You pick one, a demon of hate, a demon of revenge, perverted sex, unbridled lust for power, uncontrolled greed, distorted ambition, a demon of fear, a demon of guilt, a demon of envy, a demon of jealousy. You can name all these things, or perhaps it was a demon of lust, negativism, slander, deceit, revenge, greed, or gossip. Which one? These demons are all around us and uncontrollable. These demons will destroy life. These are the demons people today are having. A third thing to notice is that this man had given authority to this demon. Because we hear he was possessed. He was possessed, which means he had given authority to the demon to possess him. So the demon had gained control and he had lost control. Paul reminds us that the chief demon himself, Satan, is like a rolling lion, seeking whom he may devour. So there are authorities and teachings in this world that you can use to try and overpower these demons. You can turn to education, sociology, history, philosophy, psychology, even religion. All these have a certain kind of power, but not the power of Jesus. Yes, they've got their own authorities, but not the authority of Jesus. Other teachings is authority, but not the authority of Jesus, new teachings. What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? The evil spirit asked. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Hear those words. I know who you are. The demon is not even addressed. He acknowledges of his own accord that one with a great authority has arrived. Be quiet. Jesus speaks tenderly. Come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and come out of him with a shriek. Now notice this last thing. The people were amazed. Something new, something astonishing just happened. The authority of God was occurring before their eyes. Like watching Moses part the Red Sea or watching the walls of Jericho fall. The power of God was present. They could see it. What is this? They asked it. A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. We have never seen such a person like this. Who even spirits, evil spirits can obey. So there are many people in our society who are deeply troubled with demons of different kinds. Some of these people find their way into the church. Some of these people are in our families. Some of these people are co-workers. And they can cause us much hatred. Some of these people are powerless to help themselves. We need to see this. Some people have problems that are so deep that they never will think themselves out of those problems or wake themselves out or even believe themselves out. Evidently, this man that made this disturbing noise in the synagogue where Jesus was teaching was one of these disturbed people who needs outside intervention. It took a command from the master, just a command from the master to set this man free from his demons. It changed him. It just needed a command from the master. Be quiet. And that is it. You and I don't have that kind of authority. That kind of power. Maybe we may say that, but we have the power that is given to us. But we can help people who are deeply troubled, not by ourselves, but by the power of the Holy Spirit in us. 
We are able to lay hands. We are able to command the demons to leave the person. And the demons will do that. Education can make us intelligent. Sociology can give us cultural knowledge. History can give us world knowledge. Philosophy teaches us conceptual knowledge. Science teaches us the natural laws. Psychology offers behavioral knowledge. Religion imparts divine knowledge. But in the end of, of all this, do not have the authority to control the moral demons that plug men's kind. We need something more and a new teaching, something with authority. And it's within us. That power is within us. Here is what I've learned. I think in your life you have earned this too. These intellectual disciplines can offer us self-knowledge. They help us see ourselves more clearly and are incredible, important for that reason. But the more clearly we see ourselves, the more we realize our need for salvation. For some authority outside ourselves, some power to deliver us, we need something outside ourselves that can help us to deliver us. We don't simply need healing. We need to be saved, delivered from the demons seeking to destroy us. The Swiss psychiatrist Paul Tonya said this way, it is not healing alone that many stands in need of, but salvation of the assurance that the world and mankind have been redeemed. I believe Jesus brings that new kind of teaching, a new authority into this world to save, to make us whole, to overcome the demons that are bent on our destruction. That is the reason why Christ came. What is this? People ask it with amazement. A new teaching with authority, he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. How about you? Are you troubled by such worrisome? But every day, demons like worry, hatred, envy, resentment, guilt, unforgiveness. Just still cast out demons today. And I'll say, Jesus still cast out demons today. Whether they are physical, emotional, or spiritual, Jesus is still casting out demons today. You have a friend who loves to cast out demons, and that friend is Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. He wants to help if you let him. Is there a demon troubling you this day? Are you being harassed by the demon of fear? Or by the demon that tells us that we are nobody? Or by the demon of meaninglessness and despair? Are we being harassed by those? Christ has authority over all of these demons. He has authority over all. Commit your care to him. And whatever demon is troubling you today, let Christ deliver you from it. Christ will make you whole once again. Once he identifies that there is something troubling you, it's time right now for you if you are able to kneel down wherever you are and ask God to deliver you right now. He can do it. You know the demon that is troubling you or you know the demons that are troubling you. Just kneel down. Just kneel down right now. Before I pray for you. Just kneel down before I pray for you. Because Christ has got something that is, he is going to do to, to your life. Just kneel before him. And he will do it. Let us pray. Father, we come before you. Father, we come before you right now. We need you. Heavenly Father, thank you that Jesus is the only Holy One of God who came in the likeness of human flesh so that he could live a life of purity and truth and offer that perfect life as the acceptable offering for sin of the world. Thank you that he came to destroy the works of the devil. That is, work on the cross and resurrection from the dead as one victory over sin, set in death and hell. Father, I pray for deliverance right now. I pray for healing right now. Thank you that there's nothing in heaven or, earth or under the earth that is able to separate from the love of God, who is in Jesus Christ our Lord, whose name we pray. 
Father, I pray for healing right now, Lord Jesus Christ. I know you can do it. I know you are the perfect Savior. You are still performing miracles in people's lives. You are still doing your work, even today and tomorrow. You are still the same. Father, I pray in your name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, it's time we need to thank God. When something had happened in your life, you always want to thank God and appreciate what God is doing in your life. I know that God is doing something in your life. And this is time to offer our thanksgiving offering. Why do we need to give offering? We need to thank God for what God has done in our lives. You will always say, I appreciate what God has done to, my, to me. I know my condition and I know who I am. God has done great things in my life. So I would like to pray for your offering right now as you hold it. You may do it electronically. The numbers, the bank details will come out on the screen as well. You'll be able to see them. And it's up to you to make an offering or not. Father, I bring this offering in your hands. I bring every one of us who have heard the message, the message that Jesus can bring healing into our lives, that he can set us free from the, these demons that trouble us every day. Father, we thank you for you are God, the most holy one of God. You have never changed. People have, not, people have changed so much in 2,000 years that we no longer have unclean spirit. No. There's nothing that has changed. In fact, more demons have now occupied a lot of people. And they've been given names. And they hide behind these names. Thank you, Father, for this offering that we bring before you. May you bless it, anoint it, so that it can be used for your kingdom. Thank you, Father. In your name I pray. Amen. Let us receive grace. Father, we come before you. We thank you that you are God, compassionate God, who crosses boundaries and heals people. I bring to you all who need healing. Those on the margins of society that I might walk past. The homeless and elder whom I might ignore. Those addicted to substance, abuse, whom I find threatening. In your compassion, Lord, touch them with your love and give strength to touch them with my hands. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Be with us all, Lord from now and evermore. Amen.